Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today is my father's yachtzeit. Last night and today, the shir le'ed nishmas, my dear father, the Pesach Moshe, Ben Ephraim Zechut Tzadik Levracha. So I'm named after my grandfather was killed by the Nazis, and my father escaped and he by joining the Russian army and he survived miracles. How he survived the war, and he had to survive because I had to be here today. Yes. So even though his whole family was killed. He was the only one who survived because oh, I had to be here today. Wow, Rabbi. Right? Baruch Hashem. So, Elie Nishmas Ovi, of Pesach Moshe, Ben Ephraim, Zechot Tzadik, Levracha. And of course, Tzvi Dov, Ben Chaim, Pesach. Moving on up. Rabbi. Right? Yes? Yes? You're not the only survivor. You're not the only one. Okay. Unfortunately. And the same thing from my mother's town. My mother's family was the only family that was saved from her town. Everybody else was killed. It's just amazing. My mother's town, a little town in Poland, they were the only family that survived. Everybody else was killed. Huh? So anyway, what, yes? My mother is, but this is my father's yard side. So I have to wait for that for my mother's yard side. Okay. So Leil Nishmas Ovi Yemayir Pesach Moshe Ben Ephraim, and of course Tzvi Dov Ben Chaim Pesach, and Fred Ben Richard, William and Helen, Rochel Bas Yosef, David Ben Avraham. Moving on up, Avraham Ben Mordechai David, Reuben Ben Shmuel, Chana Golda Bas Yisrael, Chaim Ben Fege, Shoshana Bas Alchanan, Yeshua Ben Shmuel, Israel Ben Yaakov. Yitzchak, Mordechai, Netzach, Ben Rivka. Before we get to the Aftorah of Shabbat Shuvah, yes, didn't say anything, already have a question. Is there a tefillah that we could pray for the people of Florida? Yeah, if you pray, they should come to Eretz Yisrael. Hashem should give them seichel, pack your bags and ready to go. But they are in immediate danger. That's Hashem is sending them a signal. That's it. That they should what? My family, my they should family. pack up and come to and come to, uh, to Eretz Israel. That's the, the message, right? That's what so, I think, Rabbi. So, right? So anyway, this is uh, the best thing you can do for an neshama is to elevate the soul, is to learn Mishnah. Mishnah is the same letters as neshama, uh -huh. right? So this is the real soul food. Before KFC, this is the real soul food, elevating the soul of my beloved father and my own soul and your soul. I also have a soul. So when you learn Mishnah, which is the same letters Chanoch as Nishama, you're elevating the soul of my beloved father and your own soul. It's called a twofer. Hope everybody have a paper, yes, no? You have a paper? Now this is the, the last Mishnah, Masech de Yuma. There are 63 Mishnas, 63 tractates in Shas, and uh, one of them is called Masech de Yuma. What does Yuma mean? The day. The day. The, which day? Yom, Yom Kippur. The day par excellence Yom Kippur. So the Mishnah begins with a quote from the uh, Pasuk in Vayikra 16. So you have it highlighted there. Uh, Ki bayom, you have a copy, Moshe? Ki bayom hazeh yechaper aleichem. For on this day, he will make kapara for you. Who is the he? Hashem. Letayer eschem, to purify you. Mikol chatasechem, from all of your sins, lifnei Hashem titharu, before God you will be pure. So the question is, what is the difference between kapara and tahara? There are no extra words in the Torah. It's kibayom azeh, have it highlighted on top. On this day, yechapra lechem, he will make kapora for you, letayer eschem, to purify you. What is the difference between kapara and tahara? Is there a difference? Rav Nochem. There is, what's the difference? Right, God will make kapara and also purify us. So the Rav Salvechik says that this refers to the two types of tshuva. Tshuva meira and tshuva mehava. The first, it's called Yom Kippurim. How come it's not called Yom Tahara? Chava. The Torah uses both languages. Yechaper aleichem letayer eschem. 
So instead of calling it Yom Kippurim, why don't you call it Yom Tahara? Maybe because most hmm? people make Teshuvah through fear. Beautiful. You may have the great Rav Shalavechik. Kapara means Teshuvah Meira. Tahara is, is Teshuvah Mehava. It's much more difficult to do Teshuvah Mehava than Teshuvah Meira. So the Torah lives in the real world. Most people, if they're lucky, Hanoch, they get to do tshuva what? Miyira. That's also good. So the Torah speaks to the vast majority of people who they, it's Yom Kippurim. Because tshuva mehava is very, very difficult. It's for the select few. Halavai, we should be zoiche to do tshuva miyira. So it's called Yom Kippurim. So yechapar aleichem, the word kapara means to cover up. You know, the, the lid on top of the ark, Rav Avram. You know that lid with the lovebirds on it? What's it called? Kaporet. Why is it called kaporet? Put a lid on it. The lid that covered the ark in the Holy of Holies with the lovebirds, it's called kaporet because it covers, it covers the, the box, the ark. So kapara, if you do tshuva miyira, the sin is covered up. It's covered up. But somehow, it's still there, but it's covered up. That's tshuva miyira. So it's also good, it's covered up. Kapara means to cover up. So right? Kapara from the word kapara, kaporet, it's covered up. You do tshuva miyira, the sin is no longer exposed, it's covered up. But if you do tshuva mehava, the sin itself becomes tohor. If you do tshuva mehava, surely, the sin itself becomes a mitzvah. So look how it's implied in the puzzle. Kibayoyim azeh yechaper aleichem, Tshuva miyira, the sin is covered up. But letayer eschem, we call it letayer shem titaru, that where the sin actually becomes pure, where the sin actually becomes a mitzvah, that's tshuva mehava. And that's more difficult. So the Torah speaks about the two types of tshuvas here, and it's called yom kippurim, like Chava said, because the Torah lives in the real world. Most people, if they're lucky, just get to do Yom Kippurim, and that's also good. The sin is covered up is also good. But it's much harder and it's much greater to do Tshuva Mehava where the sin actually becomes Tahar. Lifnei Hashem Titharu, where the sin itself becomes purified. One of the sheets that you gave is what Rav Lekish says in the that's true, but is it, since it was Rav Lekish who said it, who had plenty of sins, is it maybe wishful thinking in his part that the sins become... Uh, Rish Lakish says, you do tshuva mehava, the sin becomes a mitzvah. So Rish Lakish, he was an expert because he used to be like Mayor Lansky. <laughs> Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish used to be Avi like Bugsy Siegel. <laughs> Rav Shimon, and he became the great sage Rav Shimon ben Lakish, all for the love of a woman. You look on Tractate Bumitzia, page 84, all for a pretty face. And he says, you do tshuva mehava, then what? Your avera becomes mitzvah. Did he did do tshuva mehava? Tshuva mehava means you do tshuva only because you love God, not because you love a pretty face. So the question is, Sarah, how could he be an expert on tshuva mehava? You would ask a good question. He did classic tshuva meyira means you do tshuva for ulterior motives. You fear God, you fear him, you want a pretty girl. Just do it, it's also good. But Meshim and Melakish, he testifies that he only did tshuva because he, he wanted to marry the pretty girl. Rabbi Yochanan said, if you join my yeshiva and become a, a Baal tshuva, I'll give you my daughter, my sister, a date, and she's Miss Israel. So, so what is that, Rabbi Is that tshuva meyira, tshuva mehava? It's classic tshuva meyira, it's ulterior motives. But Meshlokish is saying, you gotta start somewhere. Nike, just do it. Whatever, do tshuva for selfish reasons. You want the girl, you want to impress, you're afraid you get smacked. Just do it. Because once you do it, you're going to graduate to tshuva mehava. Says Vishlokish, I'm the living example. I started doing tshuva meyira before I was like Mayalansky. And then I graduated to tshuva mehava. So he said, if I can do it, you can do it. It's difficult, it's difficult. But if I can do it, you can do it. But he is giving me the example, no one can do tshuva mehava unless you start with what? Yeah. Tshuva meira, right? You gotta move up slowly, gradually. So the Mishnah says over here, 
כי ביום הזה יחפר לך מתאר אסכם, זו דורש רבי אלוזר בן עזריה, מכל אחד תעשה לבני השם תתורו, where it's highlighted on top, from all of your sins, before God you shall become pure. So he makes the diuk, averot pen odom lamokoim, sins between what? Men and God, yoim akipurim mechaper. Averot pen odom lechaveroi, but sins between what? Men and men, ain yoim akipurim mechaper. Yom Kippur does not atone at sheratzet chavero, until you what? You appease and apologize to the guy that you harmed. Now, if you stole from him, you swindled him, all apologies ain't going to help until you mail him a check. Right? But after you mail him a check, you still have to appease him. That Yom Kippur will not help. Yom Kippur only helps with Nei Hashem. But since between man and man, Yom Kippur doesn't help. Until you appease and apologize and do right by the person that you want harmed. Omar Rabbi Akiva, I'm reading the Mishnah. Ashreichem Yisrael, fortunate are you Israel. Lifnei mi atem itayrin, before whom, before whom do you become pure? Umi mitayr eschem, and who purifies you? So it's two questions here, you see that? Ashreichem Yisrael, look how fortunate you are, Jews. Lifnei mi atem itayrin, before whom are you purified? Umi metayer eschem, and who is the one that makes you pure? Avichem shabashamayim, your father in heaven. Now, who doesn't know that? Uh, it seems to be what? Redundant. You hear my question, Sarah? Who doesn't know that, that who purifies me? It's my father in heaven. So, what's Rabbi Kiva's chidush over here? Stay tuned. Okay? Shenemar, there's a postuk in Yecheskel. God says, "V'zorakti alechem mayim tahorim." God said, "I will spritz on you waters of purification, utahartem, and you shall be pure." Of course, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor, but God says metaphorically, "V'zorakti alechem," I will sprinkle on you mayim tahorim, waters of purification, utahartem, and you shall be pure. So that's a proof text from Yecheskel. V'omer, then he brings another proof from Yermio. Mikve Yisrael Hashem. God tells Yermio, Jeremiah the prophet, not the bullfrog, the prophet, Mikve Yisrael Hashem. What does that mean, Mikve Yisrael Hashem? The hope of Israel is God. Don't put your hope in abomination, not in Hillary, not even in Trump. Mikve Yisrael Hashem. The hope of Israel is only God. Now on top of the page, Ma Mikve Metayer Tatmeim. Just like a mikveh purifies those that are defiled, Afa Kudish Baruchu Mitayres Yisrael, God acts like our mikveh Kaviyochol. Just like a mikveh purifies one, so on Yom Kippur God acts like our mikveh, and He purifies us. Now, isn't that amazing? Wow, wow. That's pretty amazing, right? Now, if you look at the uh, the highlight in the notes there, you see the notes, the highlight there. Yecheskel Lamed Vav. See that? I have it highlighted there in the footnotes on the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Yecheskel Lamed Vav. Ben Adam. God calls Yecheskel Ben Adam. What does Ben Adam mean? You're a mensch. You're a mensch. Ben Adam means you're a mensch, right? Ben Adam. Beis Yisrael Yoshim al Admatam Yitamota. Why did God exile the Jewish people not once but twice? Because they defiled the land. The Eshpai Chamosi Aleim. God says, I will pour out my fury on them. The Holocaust. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I will scatter them among the nations. And they will come among the nations. The very fact that Jews live among Goyim, that constitutes what? Achil Hashem. Lechain, therefore, I'm continuing to read. Lechain, therefore, Emor lebeit Yisrael, say to the house of Israel, says God, Lo lemanchem ani oseh, I don't, I will not redeem you and bring you back for your own sake. Ki im l'shem kachi, but only because of what? My holy name, ashechilaltem bagoyim, that you desecrate among the nations. The kedashti eshmi hagodol amchula, the very fact that Jews live in Florida, 
constitutes what? Achil Hashem. Who says that? Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 says it, not me. Avi, the very fact that Jews live in Florida and in Borough Park, in Lakewood, even in Lakewood, constitutes a chil Hashem. Who says so? God to the prophet Ezekiel chapter 36. But some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. Okay? The very fact that you didn't live among Goyim, that's chil... Ki im l'shem kotshi ashechelaltem bagoyim. So God says, I'm going to have to schlep you out of Florida, even if it takes a hurricane to bring you here. Amen. Avi, even if it takes a hurricane to bring you here, God will schlep the Yidin even out of Florida. Okay? Now they have fear of Hashem. Uh-huh. they're going to have love. Right. Fear. Right. Amen, amen. Now. And we're going to learn to understand. The fact is that we are still there. Yeah. So why are they so terrible? But anyway, let's move on. The Mishnah compares God to a mikveh. Isn't that strange, Chanoch? The Mishnah compares the Almighty to a mikveh. Right? The top line here. Ma mikveh metayar satmeim. Just like a mikveh purifies those that are defiled. Afa kudish baruchu metayaris Yisrael. So God also purifies Israel. On Yom Kippur. Now, just like a mikveh, in order to work, you have to be totally wrapped in the water. Mm -hmm. If you have one pinky sticking out, Avi. One hair. One hair, thank you. One hair. So just like a mikvah only works if you're totally wrapped up and embraced by the water, without a chatzitza. If you have a chatzitza on your body, like schmutz or a band-aid, the mikvah don't help. So on Yom Kippur, when we immerse in God's mikvah, it has to be without a chatzitza. What's a chatzitza, Yom Kippur? Eating and drinking, and makeup, and marital relations, and wearing shoes, that's a chatzitza. No makeup on Yom Kippur, chas v'sholem. And no deodorant, chas v'sholem. That's a chatzitza. Those bodily comforts on Yom Kippur is a chatzitza. If you want God's loving embrace to enwrap you on Yom Kippur, you have to get rid of the chatzitza. No eating, no drinking, no matter of relations, no makeup, no spritzing, no anointing yourself, and no wearing leather shoes, yeah. right? That's a chatzitza. That's a chatzitza on Yom Kippur. So to immerse in God's mikvah on Yom Kippur, we have to totally give ourselves over to Him without any, how do you say chatzitza in English? Um, chatzitza, how do you say in English? Barriers, 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 okay? Now, on this Mishnah, I have four questions, even though it's not Pesach, but my father's name is Rav Pesach Moshe. Aww. So therefore, and today's is your site, so I'm going to ask four questions on this Mishnah, even though it's not Pesach, because my father's name is Rav Pesach Moshe. And we'll tie in the four questions to the four steps of tshuva, okay? Now, what are the four questions on this mission? I think you have it in front of you, no? Yeah. Question number one. Why Rabbi Kiva no other Tana? There are many Tanoyim. Why does Rabbi Kiva say, Ashrechem Yisrael? You Jewish people are very fortunate that your Father in Heaven purifies you. Now, I know that without Rabbi Kiva telling me that God purifies me. He's my Father in Heaven. Why does Rabbi Kiva have to tell me that? And how come no other Tana makes that statement? Why Dafke Rabbi Kiva? Question number two, Chava. I think you have it on your paper, no? Why ask two questions? Rabbi Kiva asked two questions. Before whom do you make yourselves pure? And who makes you pure? See, he asked two questions. Yeah. Whom? Before whom or who? I always get mixed up, Avi. Oh, before no. whom? Before cool. whom do you make yourselves pure? And who makes you pure? And he says, guess who? Avicham Shabbat Shemayim. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Hmm? Uh, I think I would know that without the Holy Rabbi Akiva. That's question number two. Or number three? Uh, number three. Uh, number three. Why do we need two different proof texts that God purifies me? One from Yechezkel and one from Yermio. 
two proof texts that God purifies me. That's tshuva me'ahava. Why is one proof text not enough? And question number four, number four, number four. Ray, you have a paper? No. Why does the word mikvah have a dual meaning? Now, the word mikvah means hope, but the word mikvah also means, Avi, a ritual pool. You know that. So in Hebrew, when you have one word with two different meanings of Abraham, they have to be what? Related. 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 So, why does the word mikvah, so let's start with four and work our way backwards. Why does the word mikvah have a double meaning, hope and ritual pool? In Hebrew, when one word has two different meanings, there has to be a connection between them. Because when a woman goes to a mikvah, she hopes to conceive a child. So therefore, in Hebrew, the word mikvah means hope. It also means a ritual pool. Because when a lady goes to the mikvah, she hopes that that night, she hopes she'll conceive a healthy baby. Hmm. That's one explanation why the word mikvah means hope and ritual pool. But of course, there's more. Just like a mikvah can't help you unless you toivel, a guy can hope chava from day till tomorrow. I want to be pure. I want to be pure. I can hope from the day to tomorrow. But Avram, if I don't get into the mikvah, will it help me? Will it? No. I can hope and really hope. For 900 years, I can hope and hope and hope. I want to get pure. But if I don't get into the mikvah, Hoping is useless and worthless. So, just like a mikvah can't help you unless you toivel, you take the plunge. So, you want to do tshuva, don't just kvetch, right? Get involved. Do the four steps of tshuva. Not enough just to hope to God. If you want God, to purify you, you've got to do the effort. You've got to do the four steps. You, what are the four steps? Aziva sachet, physically to abandon the sin. Vidui bepe, oral confession. Busha and charata, deep regret and shame for the past of Erot. And Kabbalah lahaba, a verbal commitment not to repeat those sins. So if you don't do that, if you don't get into the mikvah, then God says, how can I help you? Hoping alone is not enough. You have to hope, but you also a mikvah, hoping alone ain't gonna do it. You've got to do, you've got to immerse yourself in the mikvah by grabbing on to the four steps of tshuva. So we answered the number four, why the word mikvah and the word uh, has a double meaning, hope and ritual pool. Now the first question, why Rabbi Kiva and no other Tana? And how come he says, Avichem Shabashamayim? I know that God purifies me. Why no other Tana? I'll tell you why, Sarah. I'll tell you why. Rabbi Akiva was unique. He lived to be 120 before the Romans killed him. Wow. He lived before the Chorban, during the Chorban, and after the Chorban. He saw it all. Can you imagine? The first year after the Khurban, Moshe. The first year after the Khurban. No Bet Amigdash, no Mizbeach, no Kodesh HaKadoshim, no Koyen Godel, no Sore Mishtaleach. The Jews will say, we're undone. Oi, oi, oi. There's nothing to do. We can't be saved. So Rabbi Kiva, he lived before the Chorban, during and after. He was the unique position to console Am Yisrael. I remember there was a temple, there was a high priest, there was a scapegoat, there was incense, there was Kodesh HaKadoshim last year. This year, there's no temple, there's no Mizbeach, there's no high priest, there's no low priest, there's no scapegoat. The Yidden say, Oy vey. Ashrechem Yisrael. You don't have all that, but who do you have? Avichem Shabbat Shemayim. Him you'll never lose.
He was uniquely qualified to console Israel because he lived before the Chorban and after the Chorban. So the Jews were depressed. Who's going to be atonement? You push the scapegoat off the cliff that Sunday sheer. So long, sucker. And somehow that, somehow that atoned for all of our sins. Imagine the first year without the scapegoat. Oy vey. So Rabbi Kiva says, take a pill and calm down. Not on Yom Kippur. Take a pill and calm down. Air of Yom Kippur. You don't know all, all that, but you know who purifies you? Avichem Shabshamayim. Your Father in heaven will never abandon you. Even if you have no temple, and you don't have the temple service, and no Mizbeach Apnimi, and Mizbach Azov, and Mizbach Achitzon, but you always have Avicham Shabbat Shamayim. That you always have. So he was uniquely qualified to, uh, to what? Console us. To console us. Right? So, on Yom Kippur, we have to focus only on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You focus on your godly soul. The godly soul is a part of God, right? That we said yesterday, it's R and R for the neshama. So you zero in on your neshama without any distractions, without any chatzitzas, right? So why does he bring two proof texts? And question number two, why ask two questions before whom do you make yourself pure and who makes you pure? And why two proof texts? Elisheva, because there are two types of tshuva. Mm. There's tshuva meyira and tshuva mehava. So one is a higher level than the other, right? Uh -huh. So it's a gradual process. It's a lifetime effort. You don't do tshuva mehava right away. It can take years. The Chava to graduate from Tshuva Meyira to Tshuva Mehava. It can take years and years and years. Yeah. If you're not going to get it this year, hopefully next year we'll be ready. We're in training. Sarah, like a marathon runner, he's in training. Tshuva Meyira, we're in training. Hopefully we'll be able to make it to the marathon of Tshuva Mehava, but it's a gradual process. So we need. Two proof texts. And, and Shimon Ben Lakish, he's uniquely qualified. He's the classic case. He did tshuva because he wanted a pretty girl. Mm. That's the classic tshuva for selfish reasons. But he graduated to become the great tzaddik and sage that he was. So he's the role model that you have to start slow. You can't run the marathon unless you first learn how to walk. Right, Dev Yaakov? So tshuva mira. And hopefully one day we'll get to what? Tshuva mehava. It's called moving on up, right? Mm -hmm. Moving on up. So that's what Jim Kipper is all about. Now, tshuva, the Rambam says that tshuva is not a free lunch. A person did a terrible sin, even though he does tshuva, he has to, he has to lay a lane who suffer for it. You look at the Rambam Hilchas tshuva, a person's Mechal Shabbat, or he did a Gilead Ayot. He did tshuva, but the Ramah says, fine, but you still have to pay. You still have to pay, whether it's Gehenim or a root canal, which I had done this morning. Oh, good for you. Uh, you still have to pay. You hear this? Comes along the great Chida. Oh, what's that? Mikimia. Mekimia comes along the Chida, quoted by my grandfather, Bnei Yisachar. I hope he's proud of me. My great-great-grandfather, Bnei Yisachar. He says, when does the Rambam mean that a person does tshuva, he's still loyal, who has to suffer and get root canal? That's tshuva meyira. Uh -huh. Because it's kapara, the word kaporis means what? It's covered up. But do you ever sweep dirt under a rug, Chanoch? You sweep dirt on the rug. You don't see the you don't see the schmutz, but you see what? what? The bulge. You see the bulge. <laughs> you don't see the schmutz, Avi. It's covered up. But the bulge is there. You see in the rug? Remember the cartoons? The bulge. 
So that loyaleinu, you need suffering to get rid of the bulge. But tshuva mehava rei, there ain't no bulge. The sin actually becomes what? A mitzvah. So you don't have to suffer. This, you transform that sin into a mitzvah. Mm. No need for root canal. It looks like I only did tshuva meyira because I had root canal this morning. So that means I have to work on myself, Avi. Yeah. I have a lot of work to do. I got to go to tshuva mehava. So next year, I hope I won't need root canal. Yeah. Moving on up. It's a gradual process. We graduate. Okay? So, we, we, we what? Go from one to the other sometimes. Sometimes we really feel a hava, and then, and then you, you, all of a sudden, you slip into... It happens. Oi, Sarah, you mechaven to the Baal Shem Your wife is beautiful. She's mechaven to the holy Baal Shem Tov, Mikimia. Sarah's mechaven to the Baal Shem Tov. Mm -hmm. The Baal Shem Tov. It says, Mal Yaakov had a dream and a ladder. Malachi Elikim Olim Yordim. Now, Bashem Tov says, I don't need to know what Father Jacob dreamt 3,800 years ago on Mount Moriah. The Torah is not a history book, Golda. The Torah is GPS. Right. Why does the Torah have to tell me that Yaakov had a ladder and he saw Malachim going up and down? What's the GPS? Says the Bashem Tov, who are the angels of God going up and down? Me and you. Me and you, and you and me. We are God's angels. Sometimes we go up, but sometimes we go down. You can't, you can't help yourself. The Holy Baal Shem Tov. Yaakov was shown that his kindalach are God's angels. We are God's angels. Sometimes Avi, we go up, and sometimes we go down. It's only natural. But the Pasuk in Mishle says, Sheva Yipal Tzadik, the Tzadik will fall and stumble seven times. Yeah. Evan Ezra says that seven in Tanakh means lot? Many. 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 So why is he called the Tzadik? To come. Saying. The next word is to come. To come. God expects me to fall. He gave me a Sahara, but he expects me to get up. I go down, he expects me to go up. It's like a yo-yo. But when the gun goes off after 120, what's the final score? Yeah. Mm. Right. All of life, you're going up and down, Aviva, up and down. I'm getting dizzy, up and down, up and down. Free will. But when the gun goes off after 120, yeah. I hope I'm going to be up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What a powerful Baal Shem Tov, Sarah. You may have to the holy Baal Shem Tov. <sighs> We are God's angels. Sometimes we go up and sometimes we go down. Don't get depressed, it's natural. Satan says, you're down, stay down. You're no good, Nick, no how. That's Satan's trap. Depression, Satan's trap, says Rav Nachman, a grandson of Hashem Tov. Even though I'm down, I'm not going to stay down. You can't keep a good man down. I'm going to get up and better than before. Who proved me? King David. Yeah. After his terrible sin with Bathsheba, he became much greater because of, despite the sin, or because of the sin? I think because of the sin. It's not a license to sin, Khalila. Everybody sins. But a person sins, he can utilize that sin to grow from. I think it's called growing pains, right? Growing pains. And King David never would have been the great King David if he wouldn't have stumbled and fallen and done tshuva and done tshuva. And Yehuda, the same thing. Rav Salvechik says something incredible. Why did Yaakov take away the kingship from Yosef at Tzadik and give it to Yehuda? Yosef at Tzadik, he was the longest reigning king in Israel. He reigned 80 years. He reigned over his brothers. Wasn't he king over his brothers? Right? 80 years. So benevolent, so loving. Yosef at Sadiq, he was the natural leader of Am Yisrael, right? He could have given them back what they did to him, but he was so kind and beloved to them. 
He was the perfect leader. Why did Yaakov take away the kingship from Yosef and give it to Yehuda? Says Rav Soloveitchik, because Yosef is the tzaddik gamur. Remember, Mrs. Patifa tried to seduce him. He said, I can't do that. It's not in me. I can't do that. I can't again. He's a tzaddik gomer. Yehuda sinned with Tamar and he did tshuva. David sinned with Bathsheba and did tshuva. The Mokam Shebala tshuva omid. A tzaddik gomer can't reach there. So therefore, says Rav Savechi, God, God and ya Yaakov from God took the kingship away from the messiahship, away from whom? Yeah. From the Yosef at Tzadik, the Tzadik government, he gave it to Yehuda and, and David because they know what it's like to sin and they know what it's like to do tshuva. They are a perfect role model. Yeah. Reb Nachum, Yosef at Tzadik, at Tzadik Gomer, you, a king has to relate to the people. He has to know what it's like to sin and be depressed and do tshuva. A tzadi gomer can't be a king. You have nothing to say to me. I can't be late to you. You're a goody two-shoes. You're head in the clouds. You can't be late to me. Yosef a tzadik. It's Dafka, Yehuda, and David. They know what it's like to sin. They know what it's like to rise and fall and rise and fall. They could be the role model and the leader. David said, but we thought we decided that Yehuda, since he was just a Bnei Noach. So it's still, it's still, you know, but still the son of Yaakov. It's still the son of Yaakov, right? And it's, uh, it, but in Eretz Yisrael, they kept the mitzvahs, right? In Eretz Yisrael, they kept the mitzvahs, even though they weren't. Uh, was he in Eretz Yisrael? It was in Eretz Yisrael, right? When he did it with her, right? So uh, where was I? So it's Dafke, a person that sinned. He has a message for the people. He can relate. I know what it's like to fall. Don't be too hard on yourself. You know, sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. Sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. So David says, forgive yourself. God can only forgive you if you are willing to forgive yourself. So it's David, not Yosef. Yehuda, not Yosef, said Rav Soloveitchik. What? Isn't that amazing, yeah. right? They are the role models. They can be late to identify what it's like to fall and fall and not to be depressed despite Satan's trap. You don't know good know-how. Stay in the disco. There's no hope for you. That's what Satan says, right? Yeah. Yes? Wasn't there the same problem with Moshe, but he couldn't go and tear it to Israel with the Jews, even though that other little episode that, was, that he had, that he wasn't also capable of relating really to the Jewish people? That's a very good point that you make. The point that you made is made by whom? What a great, what's your name again? Gloria. Gloria. You make an excellent point, but who... Uh, Rashi says it. Rashi in the book of Kings, why God retired Eliyahu Hanavi. God retired him, took him out, right? Mm -hmm. He couldn't relate anymore. He couldn't relate. He became too holier than thou than the people. He had nothing to say to the people. So, and the same thing with Moshe Rabbeinu. He couldn't, he's, he became so super holy that he could no longer tolerate the people. So when that happened, God retired him and Eliyahu Novi. I hope they had an IRA, I hope. Oh, wow. What? But um, <laughs> good point that you, Rashi in the Book of Kings too makes that point by Eliyahu Novi and the Rav Sabetchik applies it to Moshe Rabbeinu as well, excellent. Well, why God retired Eliyahu Novi, right? He says the people, the people, uh, can complaining, bad-mouthing the people. God doesn't want to hear that. God doesn't want to hear that. God wants you to be Melamed Tzchus on Am Yisrael. If you can't be Melamed Tzchus on Am Yisrael, I say it in English, Melamed Tzchut. No, Melamed Tzchus says, uh, find merit for Am Yisrael, then you have to retire. So once Moshe Rabbeinu and Leon Novi stopped being Melamed Tzchut on Am Yisrael, they had to retire. So let's speak a little bit about Shabbos Shuvah. Now, we say Shabbos Shuvah, but it's actually Shabbos Shuvah. Uh, we're going to read Hosea 14. 
And why is it called Shabbat Shuvah? Because the first word of the Haftorah is what? Shuvah Yisrael. You don't need the Tav, Avi. It's Shuvah. Teshuva comes from the root Shuva Yisrael. God tells the prophet Hosea, return Israel until Hashem your God. Return to send up. Shuva Yisrael. Doesn't mean repentance, surely. I don't know what that means. Shuva Yisrael. God tells Hosea, return Israel to Hashem because you have stumbled in your sin. Kui machem devorim. How do you return? Take with you words. What does that mean? Vidu bepeh. Avi, this speaks of Torah. You want to return to God? Kui machem devarim. Hosea chapter 14. Take with you words. It's called vidu bepeh. Oral confession. Why do we have to confess? God knows what I did, and I know what I did. So why is no shuva without oral confession? You hear my question? I know what I did, and he knows what I did. So the Chinuch says that when I confess the sin verbally, I'm so ashamed that hopefully next time I'm tempted to do that sin, it'll act as a barrier. So if you say it out what you did, you don't sweep it under the rug, so next time you're tempted to do that sin, hopefully it'll act as a break. So the Torah, so God tells Hosea, Kui machem devarim. You have to take with your words, Yeshuv el Hashem, oral confession, verbal confession, but without Busha and Charata, it doesn't work either, and return to God. Now, of all the prophets in Tanakh, why did God choose Hanoch Hosea to be the prophet of Shuva? There are many other great prophets in Tanakh. Why did God pick Hosea? Miki, you ever, Miki, you ever wonder why? The Talmud says, because he was a descendant of Ruvain. Who was the first person to do tshuva? Ruvain. It says, Vayoshev Ruvain el Habor. Ruvain sinned with Bilha, whatever he did there, wasn't nice. So even though he didn't actually do it, but it wasn't nice what he did there with his father's concubine, right? Oh, yeah. We moved the beds there, right? Tell it like, no cover ups, tell it like it is. The Torah says he slept with her. Now, the oral Torah says he didn't actually do it. He wanted to do it, didn't actually do it, okay? But it was a terrible sin. It wasn't actually did it, but he did a sin. And he did tshuva. So since he's the first one, Golda, to do tshuva, so God said to Ruvain and Shemayim, your great-grandson will be the prophet of tshuva, Hosea, because you, Ruvain, were the first to do tshuva. You understand that? I don't, because the Medjish says that Oda Marishan was the first to do tshuva. Amnacham, you should have asked me that. Right? Right, come on, hit me, hit me. There seems to be conflicting Medjishes. God tells Ruvain, because you're the first to do tshuva, your great-grandson, Hoshea, will be the prophet of tshuva, because you set the role, uh, the example. But Hanoch, the other Medjish says, no, Oda Marishan did tshuva. So what's the answer? I'm prepared, they're both right. Adam did tshuva meyira. The first human being to do tshuva mehava was Ruvain. And therefore his anical, how do you say that in English? His anical, his great grandchild was chosen to be the prophet of uh, of tshuva, because he's the first human being, his zayda was, to do tshuva mehava. Adam did tshuva miyira. Ruvain was the first to do tshuva mehava. What did he do wrong, Ruvain? Well, he did something there with Billah which wasn't nice. Changed the beds. Changed the beds, changed yeah. the linen, yeah. whatever it was there. So it what wasn't was nice what he did. What are you mixing into your, into your father's marital life? He mixed into his father's marital life, not his business. Well, not his business. Well, you're fair. But still, but, you know, you don't mix into your father's uh, fair, uh, marital relations life. So it was a terrible infraction. And, but he did tshuva mehava. And therefore, and therefore, his great great grandson, Hosea, was the prophet of uh, tshuva. Mm. 
God comes, if you look in the book of Hosea in the beginning, this is chapter 14, you look in the beginning, Sarah, God comes to Hosea and he says, your people have sinned. They're no good. What, sh what are you going to do about it? So you know what he says? Trade him in. Mm. Trader horn. Mm. Trade him in, he says. Trade him in for a younger model. That's what, look in the Hosea 1. Look, God, you got the, the Watusis and the Ubangis, and you got the, what, the Somalians, and you got what? Many nations. How many in the UN there? Much more. Trade him in. That's not what God wanted to hear. So God said, before that, I want you to marry a woman of ill repute. Her name was Gomer. Now, Gomer in modern English is she was really run around Sue. Remember run around Sue? Now, she was not a very modest woman, to say the least, Aviva. So he's shocked. Listen, I'm ordering you to marry Gomer. She uh, moonlights. <laughs> so he's shocked, Leah. But the, God orders him to do it. The prophet, God tells you, God told Abraham, kill your son. Did he have a choice? He was about to do it. God says, marry this uh, runaround Sue. So with a broken, he marries her. And he has children with her. And he's not even sure that the children are his. Because she didn't change her evil ways. She continued to be run around Sue after she was Mrs. Prophet. She continued to be run around Sue. Remember that song? He's not sure maybe the kids are the traveling salesmen. He doesn't even know. And then God says, okay, you have three kids with her? Throw her out, divorce her. So he says, God, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I love her. Maybe the children are mine. I can't divorce her. God says, I'm ordering to divorce her. I can't do it. She's my wife, Ishtar Kigufa, despite all of her sins and her infidelity, I still love her. So God says, say what? Say what? Hello? God, look at Isaiah 1, uh, Hosea 1. Listen to yourself, man. You took this woman of ill repute. And you're not even sure that the children are yours. Yet you're madly in love with her. The Jewish people are my beloved wife. I love them much more than any husband can love a wife. How dare you tell me to trade them in? Eat your words, Hosea. That's good. What a powerful message. What a po I'm glad I came too. What a powerful message. Hmm? No, then God said, as an example, God was testing him. He couldn't do it. So God said, if you can't do it, how do you expect me to divorce my beloved people? God's love for us is a million times stronger than any love a husband can have for a wife or any parent for a child, right? God loves us on so, on so many different levels. As a husband, as a parent, his love is all-encompassing. As, as, as a creator, a lover, a parent, at all different levels. So how dare you tell me to trade in my beloved people? So he learned the message the hard way, Hosea, but he finally got the message, right? He finally got the message. They, they took, some, took some learning in the school of hard knocks, but he finally, uh, he finally got the message. Now this idea goes so strong. In this week's parasha, we don't have the books here, but Deuteronomy 31 we're going to read. Verse 27, where God says, I know you're stubborn and mamr meitem im Hashem. You are rebellious with God. Now, if you read the English, it says you're rebellious against God. 
But the Hebrew says, Im Hashem. Mm. It says, Mamar Mayitem Devarim 31, Pasuk 27. Re you have been rebellious with God. Now, English says against God. It would have said Neget Hashem. But don't change the text. You've been rebellious with God. Should say Neget, says the Maral, this idea. No matter how rebellious we are, I can't stop loving you. I made up my mind. It's a good thing. Mamma Hashem, the Verbum 31, says the morale, even though we're rebellious and stubborn and stiff necked, Im Hashem. God never leaves us despite our rebellion. And this idea is taken so graphically in back in uh, Bamidbor 36, God says, do not defile the land of Israel, which I dwell, because I, God, dwell amongst the Jewish people. Do not defile the land, because I dwell in the land, and I dwell among the Jewish people. So Rashi says, af bazman shehem temeim, even when the Jewish people are defiled with sin, shechina beinehem. What does that mean? I can't stop loving you, right? No matter how we sin, God cannot stop loving us, right? Hmm? But sometimes the love is tough love, right? But it's all love. That's the idea that it's all love. And in this week's parsha in Vayelech, God speaks about haster ponim, right? I will hide my face on that day. Which day? The Holocaust. I will hide my face on that day. So where's the comfort there? The Pesach starts out, Anoichi. What does that remind you, Golda? Despite that God is hiding his face, he's really not hiding his face. He is there with us, suffering with us. It looks like I'm hiding my face, but the the same word of the Ten Commandments is there. God is there, even though it looks like he's not there. Hmm? God suffers along with his people. Imo onochi betzara. God suffers along with his people. Now, when we daven, when we have an ache and a pain, <clears throat> Sarah, why am I davening for? If God sends me an ache and a pain, thanks, I needed that. Remember that commercial? I'm dating myself. Thanks, I needed that. <laughs> right? We believe. You have root canal, you have a pain. That's what I need. You can't always get what you want, but... You get what you need. So why should a sick person pray to stop being sick? The doctor makes, gives someone a uh, painful operation. You tell the doctor, oh, don't operate, don't operate. The person needs that painful operation to get well. So the sick person, why is he sick? Nobody gets sick for nothing. That's what he needs for his neshama to get better. How dare he pray that the sickness, you hear the Shoshana, how dare he pray the sickness go away? Mm. You ever wonder about that? Surely, let's, let's stop and think over here. Mm. God is, there's one profession God calls himself in the Torah. Doctor. doctor. That's why every Jewish mother wants her son to be what? <laughs> My son, the doctor. Because it's God's profession. One profession, that's it, lady. only one. So God, so Rav Tzadik HaKon says why? Because just like a doctor sometimes gives painful <laughs> Surgery, yet you pay the doctor a lot of money. You say, don't operate, I don't want the pain. No, the person wants it. And he pays him heavily to save his life. So God says, you trust Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Kildare, Dr. Casey, you can trust God, right? right. So why does a sick person pray that the, uh, the pain should go away? You, you know who asked this question? Rav Chaim Velazhin asked this question. You know what Rav Chaim Velazhin was? The Vilna Gons Talmud, he asked this question. Chava. Now hear this. Fasten your seatbelts for this. 
The answer is found in Samuel 1.1. 1, 1. Now, if you don't know Hebrew, now we just read it in Rosh Hashanah, it's Chaval. It says, that the spal al chana al Hashem. She prayed on Hashem. Now, the English says, Chana, pray to God. But anyone who knows Ulpan 103, pray to God, it should have said that spal al chana El Hashem. It doesn't say El Hashem. It says Al Hashem. What does that mean? The English of Terrell tell me. What does that make sense? They say Hannah prayed to God, but it don't say that. It doesn't say El, it says Al. Like she called upon him. She prayed for God, says the Chaim Belazhin. Psalm 91, Imo Anochi Betzari, if I'm suffering that I can't have a child, who's suffering? God, do yourself a favor. Give me a baby so you'll stop suffering. <laughs> you hear of Chaim Volozhin? <gasps> the sick person is praying not for his, for his tsar, for the tsar of the Shekhinah. Psalm 91. When a Jew suffers, the Shekhinah suffers. When a child is sick, who suffers? Doesn't the parents suffer? Yeah. The mother and the father? Yeah. The perfect analogy, except a hundred times more, or maybe a million times more. God is our beloved parent. He says in Psalm 91, I am suffering with him. Who's him? Every individual yid. So at the spal chana al Hashem, it's not a typo. She prayed for God. If I'm suffering and I can't have a baby, God, you're suffering. Do yourself a favor and give me a baby. And I'll, and I'll him like That's why the sick person prays for the tsar of the Shechina. She God, okay, I, thanks, I needed that. Right. But you're suffering too. You have to feel the pain of the Shechina. That's prayer. Chaim Volozhin, take it to the bank. The star disciple of the Vilna Gon. He reports, Chaim Volozhin, the Vilna Gon, when he had a, a difficult Yushalmi or a difficult uh, Rashi he, he couldn't understand, he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't eat and he wouldn't sleep. And, and a Malach would come, Rav Chaim Velazhin would hear, a Malach would come and say, I'll explain you what Rashi meant or the Yushalmi. And he says, go away. He heard behind the door ordering the Malach to go away. I have to find the answer myself. I don't want you to tell me, Malach. So long. Chaim Velazhin reports he heard from behind the door the Vilna Gon ordering the Malach away. I don't want you to explain to me what Rashi meant. Ashvera Rashi, Ashvera Rambam. I have to find it on my own. Amelim Batoda. I wouldn't, I wouldn't order the Malach away. I'd say, bring it on, bring it on, right? But the Vilna gone, that's why the Vilna gone. And Chaim Velazhin writes that. <laughs> so anyway, on Sunday, Mir Hashem, we're gonna have a shear on the scapegoat, a bribe to Satan? Oh, what is okay. that all about? That That's Sunday at two o'clock. Yes. Satan's bribe, not bribe, Satan's bribe, the scapegoat. Two o'clock, Shabbat Shalom, thank you very much.